tales for dark nights. Knuckle Supper Written by Drew Stepik Performed here by Jason Hill Chapter 18 Clerics The Lord's Prayer finally concluded its broadcast at 6 a.m. Our alarm clock was a quick flash of the sun lamps. Look out, Reynolds. Damn it! I tried to take cover, but my skin was still attacked by the UV rays. Come on, man! <laughs> Herman laughed. It only lasted a few seconds, and I rushed to the sink and splashed some water on my chest. You could have warned me about the wake-up call, dick. Yeah, but I have to suck it up every morning because I don't have the luxury of a pillow to hide behind like a little girl. Besides, I'm getting used to it. Damn. <laughs> you should have seen your face. Forgetting that the custodian didn't refill my paper towel dispenser, I tugged on the lever only to come up empty. There ain't no towels. They know better than to give you a bum's blanket. I punched in the dispenser. Obviously, they were never going to give me anything to dry my hands on, so my jeans would have to do. Hey, Reynolds, check this out. Herman closed his left eye and inhaled. Slowly, his right eye began squirming up the table back into its socket. With one last pop, it went back in. For the record, it went in crossed, but at least it was in its home. Impressed, I asked, how'd you do that? They didn't knock my eye out. I did it myself. Figured the worse I looked, the easier they'd be on me. They are religious folk, after all. He smiled through the pain, obviously congratulating himself for his cleverness. The sound of a bank vault door being cranked open down the walkway from our cells was followed by the sound of combat boots clomping their way on the cement toward us. I jumped back onto the bed like a little boy playing video games after bedtime and closed my eyes. That's not going to do you any good, fool. They've been watching us all night and all morning. You're so stupid sometimes. They know you're awake, so get up and get ready for breakfast. My stomach boomed. What's for breakfast? Denny's? Pig slop. The same stuff you wasted last night. I didn't waste it, Herman. I used it to save your life. My name ain't Herman, he growled. Good morning, boys. I peeked out from under my pillow. Two guards dressed in Gestapo vestments stood in front of our cells. One of them held two buckets and an IV bag. The other held a cattle prod and a gat. The guard with the gun leaned up to my cell bars. I know you're awake, white guy. That's a pretty cool tattoo you have there. I rushed the front of my cell but restrained myself before I reached it. The guard with the buckets and the IV snickered. Well, he must be confused and thinks you're the Riddler, Tim. The other guard chimed in. Go for it, junkie. Tim nudged him with his elbow. Yeah. Do you need to be reminded of what happened last night, demon? Just do what they say, Reynolds. Take a good look at me. Herman rolled his eyes around. It's just a matter of time before you end up like this. Even though his advice didn't necessarily calm me, I was reminded that both of us were in this predicament because of my awful decisions. I looked at both priests. Demon? What are you talking about? I figured if I played along, they might cough up some information. Not Tim walked toward me. You're a demon who shouldn't be alive. I inched my face by extending my neck as close to the bars without setting off the sun lamps. What's your definition of alive, friend? I'm walking and talking, aren't I? Real Tim jumped back into the conversation. You're walking now. We'll see how long that lasts. Herman sighed. 
Christ, just let them give you some food, Reynolds. Face it, your tattoo is gay. Let's move on. I snapped my fingers at Herman. Wait a second. I deserve an explanation. I looked back at real Tim and not Tim. Why are we here? Well, you'll find out soon enough, demon. After patting real Tim on the neck, not Tim went back to Herman's cell and hit a button on a car alarm key ring. The cell door slid open. Cautiously, he walked in and exchanged the IV bag on the stand next to Herman's legs on the table. Damn, you stink, Cobra. Herman lay crippled as the adventurous guard moved close behind the Rasta's head. Check this out. He put his finger in Herman's brain, causing his legs to jolt. Dance. Both guards laughed. All Herman could do was lay there and try to enjoy the pig's blood they fed him intravenously. Not Tim exited the cell, clicked his keychain again, and then walked back toward me. He pressed another button and a small doorway opened up at the front base of my cell. Real Tim observed my curiosity and fired up his cattle prod. Keep staring at it. Even if you broke every bone in your body, you'll never be able to get through that opening. He tapped the UV lamps behind him with the prod. Not Tim walked up to the hole, dropped his bucket and kicked it in toward my feet. The top of the food bin skimmed the edge of the hatch, but it didn't trigger the sun lamps. Satisfied he'd fed the stray dog, he clicked the keychain one last time and the cubbyhole closed. Max says, have a nice breakfast, real Tim added. The two priests bumped arms again. A cobra. Tell him who Fat Mac is. After shooting me sarcastic, sad faces complete with pantomimed tear rubbing, real Tim and not Tim yucked their way back down the hall. I think I might have heard a high five when they reached the door at the end of the hall. Herman, what kind of priests are these guys? Some kind of religious militia? Don't call me Herman anymore. I picked up my bucket and began shoveling guts into my mouth. Well, since I've made it clear that I refuse to call you King Cobra, get over it and deal with it. What are you going to do about it anyway? As the energy dripped back into his body via the blood bag, the crust on his back started to heal, becoming a taffy-like yellow pus. I already told you, Reynolds. They're the cloth. We're in a basement of the goddamn church. I think it's where we were born. I flipped a morsel of pig liver out of my cell and out of Herman's table. He snorted and inched his head up. With the aid of his forehead and nose, he slipped it into his mouth. Look, he said as he consumed the food with his near toothless gums. I don't know the whole story, but... I'm almost sure this is why we're the way we are. I threw him another piece, hoping that if I gave him more treats, he would tell me more. And? Using the same head-to-nose trick, he inched the food into his mouth. And nothing. That's all I know. Then why didn't you ever tell anybody, Herman? I did. He chomped on the pig, trying to prevent choking on big pieces that he couldn't decompose without teeth. The old man, Pico. He knows just as much as me. He might know other things. More, please. More what? I held a long string of intestine up to his face. Rather than play SeaWorld with me, he just closed his eyes. Feeling bad, I threw it to him. Unfortunately, it landed on his brain. Oh, shit, Herman, I'm sorry. He bent his head sideways and tossed the food like a burger patty from the top of his head onto the table. He extended his tongue, latched onto it, and rolled it up into his mouth. I actually didn't think he knew anything else, so I switched subjects. Do you think that clock is right? Probably not. But who cares? They're giving me some kind of lobotomy over here. I walked over to my toilet and looked for a seat. There wasn't one. I doubt if they knew toilets were one of my favorite weapons, but their ability to vamp-proof my cell was an A-plus effort nonetheless. 
Yeah, I can see that, Herman. I pulled my pants down and sat on the cold rim. Don't you dare take a shit, Reynolds. What do you want me to do? I haven't gone since I got here. I dropped a big loaf, a clean exit, and shot water back up my sphincter like a trailer park bidet. The splash felt good. Herman closed his eyes. Like I want to see your little white man dick. Sorry, I'm not a seven foot tall black dude, asshole. Shit, where's the toilet paper? <laughs> You're going to have to use your hand. <laughs> I looked up to a camera on the wall. Hey, I need some TP in here. I'm not going to give you any paper, Reynolds. Use your hand and then wash it off after. I eyeballed Herman's colostomy bag resting on the floor next to his bed. At least when I lived on Skid Row, there was always something to wipe with. Making a sour face by scrunching his eyes and nose together, Herman tried to avoid my stench. Ah, deal with it. I waited until I was finished and then wiped myself. I flushed. Walked over to the sink and used almost half of the pink juice in the soap dispenser. My hand smelled like free grooming at Incontinence Dog Park. So, who is this fat Mac I keep hearing about? Herman relaxed his scrunched face. God damn, you stink. He's their leader. He was the only one I've spoken to before I got caught. I took some innards out of my bucket, walked back to my cot, and then placed the pieces over my seared eyes like cucumbers. So, let me get this straight. Mac is the leader of a crew of lunatic priests. Come on, that's almost as asinine as a gang of pothead vampires called the Battlesnakes. I told you where that came from, Reynolds. Not really. You told me a bunch of stories about Black Panthers and Superflies. Now, you're telling me a crazy story about us being part of some experiment. Do you even have any idea where you come from, or are you just throwing bullshit my way to annoy me? I know where I'm from, bitch. The only one of us that's older than me, and knows more, is the old gimp. Did Pico save you too? Hell no. I didn't even know he existed until I saw an old ass man running with your junkie crew. Look, Reynolds, we exist. We do drugs and we kill people. What more is there to know? I don't even care what I am or where I come from right now. All I do care about is being jacked up on this table with my head cracked open. The steel door latched open at the end of the hall and then closed again. Those pricks again? I asked. Herman licked his lips. We should be so lucky. A single pair of soft-soled shoes squeaked down the hall. They didn't clomp like the boots the guards were wearing. They stopped directly in front of my cell. Hello, Mr. Reynolds. The priest began. Low lights... He then whispered into a lavalier microphone hanging near the center of the white square on the collar of his standard-issue clerical uniform. The sun lamps hummed to life. They weren't on a high enough frequency to burn me, but they were powerful enough to deplete all my energy. I rubbed the pig parts on my eyes. Although the lights didn't bother me too much, I didn't have enough energy to get up and take cover. And the warbling heat massaged me almost into a daze. Open cell, he said into the mic. The cell door popped open. He grabbed a wooden chair from the hall and dragged it into my cell. Having difficulty moving, I took my fleshy tanning specks off. The priest pulled the chair into the center of my room and pointed to it. Do you mind? He asked. Whatever, I said, unsuccessfully recovering my eyes. As the pig part slid down the sides of my face... My arms loosened and dropped to my sides. He put out his hand to shake. Well, Mr. Reynolds, it is a pleasure to meet you as an adult. Too exhausted to shake, I said. It's not mutual. He lifted the lavalier back up to his mouth. Increase lights. Feed Bible. 
Per his demands, the lights intensified slightly and passages from the Bible blared from the speakers. I tried to roll under my pillow for cover, but I was too weak to move. He sat down in the chair and plucked an apple out of his pocket and brushed it off. Taking a bite, he said, Oh, I'm not offended that you won't shake my hand. I understand. The only thing I wanted him to understand was that if I weren't incapacitated, I would strangle, mutilate, and kill him. My name is Father Martin Nicotier. Most people call me Fat Mac. I turned my head to get a closer look at him. Mac was a small man in his fifties or sixties. He had slicked back hair that mixed reds and browns with grey highlights. The hair tried valiantly to cover odd thinning patches all over his head. His eyes blinked constantly and were submerged in a strange population of freckles that fused together, almost forming a birthmark. The pigmentation blotches created a raccoon-like mask on his face. His bulbous nose started small at the bridge and ended in two huge nostrils that opened and closed erratically. It was a bizarre tick for someone who presented himself so calmly. He had extremely slight lips, which was unfortunate because his teeth were chipped away and riddled with gaps. Below the burst dam that was his mouth sat his butt chin that swirled into a repulsive scab. Still lower, his liver-spotted turkey neck sprouted from his priest outfit. Covered from that point to the floor, I didn't have to use my imagination to think about what other horrors were under the cloth. He pulled a rubber hood over his head to protect him from the rays. Hot enough for you? Fuck off! I squeezed out as I tried to shield myself from the sun lamps in the shadow of his oblong head. God bless you, my son, he said, standing up and making the sign of the cross. His eyes twinkled as they followed the movements of his hand. Do you know who I represent? He took his seat. The artificial sunlight blew across my body like an oscillating fan, blowing fire across my exposed flesh. Cloth, I said. He patted me on the leg, deepening my blistering pain. Correct. We are indeed men of the cloth. Did your adversary... He produced a small notepad from a pocket as he took another bite from the now smoking apple. Well, oh, hell, here it is. Herman. <laughs> Did Herman tell you that? He looked over at Herman and waved. Hello, Herman. That's a much better name. Don't you think? He chomped on the apple and licked the roof of his mouth. Having trouble reading through the sweat that rolled into his eyes, he produced a pair of reading glasses from yet another pocket. As he wiped off the lenses, he rested them on the end of his nose. Herman stayed silent. The light was still dim in his cell and he wanted to keep it that way. Ah, oh, you seem curious as to where you come from. More so than anyone else like you. Well, this is it. He raised his arms in praise. This is where you were brought into the world. When I fell in and out of consciousness wishing that I weren't subdued because I did want answers. This joker was pulling my dick to prove that he was in control. I can tell that you're tired from all the excitement, so I'll let you rest until you have more time to let this information sink in. As he stood up, wiped some sweat off his cheeks and littered his apple core on the ground of my cell, he closed his little notebook and placed it back in his pocket. Then, he took off the reading glasses, folded them, and placed them in the breast pocket on the front of his uniform. From the same pocket, he pulled out a bottle of holy water. Pressing to overcome my nausea, I felt my gums getting weak and my teeth loosening. <laughs> holy water doesn't do shit, old man, I said. He unscrewed the top of the bottle. Oh, I'm afraid this isn't holy water, my son. Excitedly, he accidentally knocked over his chair... It's hydrochloric acid. He began reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I grabbed the side of the bed, too weak to pull myself out of the way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Again he made the sign of the cross. This time, however, he poured the acid 
starting at the top of my chest and traveling all the way down to my pelvis. I didn't cry. I didn't move. I was nearly paralyzed. The only movement I made was to close my eyes as he opened me up like a Ziploc bag. Give us this day our daily bread, he continued, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As he dug into the last portion of the verse, he switched direction, going now from nipple to nipple. I felt the water down acid eating my skin away, like he dropped a nest full of parasites on me and hung a sign under my chin that said, Welcome. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. He threw a syringe on the floor next to my cot. I didn't open my eyes, but I faintly heard him sashay his soft shoes out of my cell. I felt the ground rumble as the bars closed behind him. A piercing drone of pain tickled my ears and overloaded my brain. Amen, he concluded the prayer. Lights off, gospel off. Mr. Reynolds, there's blood and methadone in the syringe. Fucking meth adone. My animal instincts demanded that I jump off the bed and rip his balls off, but my spent body didn't respond. Instead, I slipped into a comatose state from a combination of the lights and the acid. My mind spoke louder than the fury, too, telling me that if I rolled onto my side or sat up that my guts would splash all over the floor... The lights went off, and the motion sensor zapped on. (laughs) Damn, son, Herman laughed. You just got fucked the fuck up. Good evening. This is Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast. You've been listening to a chapter from the award-winning novel Knuckle Supper by best-selling author Drew Stebeck. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition, and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckle Bald, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Check out the links in the video description and sticky comments below to pick up a copy today and show your support for indie horror. Also, please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded non-profit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to, or involved in, prostitution and pornography. Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepick and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights